Chapter 10, The Age of Jackson. After the fiasco of the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson became really popular during that four-year period. <clears throat> um, and he was also a member of the House of Representatives. So he was really popular. And he was really popular um, through all these democratic changes that were happening in the country. Anyway, the supporters of Jackson were determined that their candidate for the next election of 1828 was going to be him, Andrew Jackson. So they will create a new political party called the Democratic Party. This actually is a, an extension of the old Democratic-Republican Party. Now Jackson, as his running mate, will choose John C. Calhoun, who you see in this picture right here, who um, was a guy from... Um, South Carolina. Anyway, Jackson and Calhoun will easily defeat John Quincy Adams in his bid to um, be reelected as president with a record number of votes. So this just shows that <clears throat> John Quincy Adams was not popular, and I believe most people believe that he gained the presidency through a corrupt bargain. Andrew Jackson saw his victory as a win for the common people. And in order to reward his supporters for winning, he gave them jobs in his, in his uh, government. This became known as the spoils system, and that means the practice of giving government jobs to political backers. One of Jackson's closest friends uh, that he made a member of his cabinet was uh, Martin Van Buren. He was his secretary of state. And uh, he also re relied a great deal on a lot of his friends that were part of something called the Kitchen Cabinet, which was an informal group of trusted advisors who sometimes met in the White House kitchen. One of the first issues that Andrew Jackson has to face as president was tariffs. In 1827, the year before Jackson was elected, northern manufacturing or manufacturers began demanding a tariff on imported woolen go goods. The Northerners wanted this tariff to help protect their industries from foreign competition. Um, Southerners um, didn't like it. They opposed the tariff, saying it would hurt their economy because they depended on trade with Great Britain and other countries in the South. Before Andrew Jackson took office, Congress placed a high tariff on imports. Uh, the angry Southerners called it the Tariff of Abominations. The South did not like this tax because it cost more to get goods than they, uh, that they needed. So, of course, that's why they call it the Tariff of Abominations. This diagram kind of shows you an example of this. The British cloth cost $4 a roll. And as it's coming to the United States, a 25% tariff would be added to it, which in this case would add a dollar more to the roll. So now this British-made cloth that the South was getting now cost $5 instead of $4. So it costs more to get it. Now, the cloth that's made in the United States costs $4. So if they bought it in the United States, it would be cheaper. But the South depended on trade from Britain, so it cost them more. Southerners protested this tariff of abominations. One of its strongest critics was the vice president, uh, John C. Calhoun. Um, they believed that it was a state's right to... N nullify or get rid of a tax that they felt was unconstitutional. So that whole idea is called nullification, and that is the idea that a state could reject any federal law that was judged to be unconstitutional. So South Carolina, South Carolina enacted the Nullification Act to void the tariffs, and this began began something. Yeah, this began the nullification crisis. So this is conflict between the supporters and the opponents of nullification. Uh, one of the biggest, the, you know, John C. Calhoun, one of the biggest uh, opponents of this um, tariff, will actually resign his seat as vice president because of this issue. The president condemned nullification. In fact, he declared that he would enforce any law in South Carolina and um, he even had laws passed to allow him to force the state to follow the law. 
But then comes Henry Clay, who eventually proposed a compromise that would gradually lower the tariff over several years, and everything was all great once again. Another issue that pops up is the Second Bank of the United States. It had received a 20-year charter, and it came up for renewal in 1832. Andrew Jackson did not like the Bank of the United States, and he um, vetoed its renewal in 1832. Some states started to take action um, about the bank's legality, if you will. The state of Maryland tried to pass a tax that would limit the bank's operations. A guy named James McCulloch, who was the cashier of the bank's branch in Maryland, refused to pay this tax. The state took him to court, and in the Supreme Court decision called McCulloch versus Maryland, the Supreme Court ruled that the National Bank was constitutional. After two terms of presidency, uh, Andrew Jackson will not run for a third term, and his Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren, or he became the Vice President after uh, Calhoun uh, stepped down, but Martin Van Buren will become President in 1837, still riding on the popularity of Jackson. However, soon after Martin Van Buren becomes President in 1838, uh, an economic depression hits called the Panic of 1837. Excuse me. Yeah, Panic of 1837. So he became president right before that. Now, people are going to blame Martin Van Buren, which is a natural response when something happens. You always blame the person in charge. But Martin Van Buren was just barely in as president. It was really Andrew Jackson's economic policies that contributed to the uh, economic depression. Regardless, Van Buren was easily defeated in the election of 1840 by a brand-new political party's candidate. The party was called the Whig Party. And their candidate was a war hero named William Henry Harrison, who will defeat Martin Van Buren in the election. Now, William Henry Harrison will last only one month as president because when he gave his inaugural address, he did it in the freezing cold rain, and he got pneumonia and died a month later. Now, Andrew Jackson was not a fan of the Native American, and um, he and other political leaders wanted to open up this land for American settlement. So Congress passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which authorized the removal of Native Americans living east of the Mississippi to a new land that was designated Indian Territory in the West, which today is now Oklahoma. And Congress approved the creation of something called the Bureau of Indian Affairs to manage the removal of these Indians. Native American tribes had different reactions. Uh, tribes like the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw just automatically went to Indian Indian Territory. Uh, some tribes, like in Illinois, led by a guy's name, Chief Black Hawk of the Fox and Saw, decided to fight rather than leave, but eventually they moved to the reservations. Osceola was an um, Indian that lived in Florida, and he will lead his tribe in a battle called the Second Seminole War. They do lose that and get forced to the reservation. Now, the Cherokee had a different way of approaching it. They had their own kind of self-government in Georgia, and uh, unfortunately, the state of Georgia took their land away. So instead of fighting or just moving to the Indian reservation, they sued to get their land back. In the Supreme Court case Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court ruled that the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community in which the laws of Georgia had no force. So that means that the Cherokee could have their land back and be kind of this semi-independent group. Uh, it's, the court also stated that only the federal government, not the states, had authority over Native Americans. Georgia ignored the court's ruling, however, and Andrew Jackson took no action against Georgia to make it follow the ruling. And so the Cherokee were forced to leave anyway, even though the Supreme Court ruled that they could have the land. In 1838, the United States troops forced the Cherokees on an 800-mile march to Indian Territory called the Trail of Tears. One-fourth of the 18,000 Cherokee on this trip died. That ends Chapter 10.